Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanante. Hi, this is Mike Passanante, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about something on the minds of most hospital finance professionals, the Medicare Appeals Backlog. And to help me sort that out, I'm joined by Nicole Manuel. Nicole is a partner in the Raleigh office of Gordon and Reese, a member of the healthcare practice group. For more than 17 years, Nicole has maintained a litigation practice concentrating on Medicare and Medicaid litigation, healthcare regulatory compliance, administrative law, and regulatory law. Nicole frequently lectures on healthcare law, the impact of the Affordable Care Act, and regulatory compliance for providers, including physicians, home health and hospice, dentists, chiropractors, hospitals, and durable medical equipment providers. Nicole served as North Carolina Assistant Attorney General in the Health and Public Assistance section, where she gained a thorough understanding of the Medicaid system that informs her practice today. Nicole, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Nicole, could you give us a short background on the Medicare Appeals Backlog and explain how we got to where we are today? Sure, absolutely. The Medicare Appeal Backlog really came into play about 2011. As your listeners, I'm sure, are well aware, the uh, Medicare Appeal Procedure is a five-level step procedure. The first being the redetermination by the company who made the adverse determination in the first place, and the second being a reconsideration by a qualified independent contractor The third level is where we have the Medicare appeals backlog. It is at the level where you actually appear before an administrative law judge or an ALJ. At that level, in 2011, we had approximately 59,600 Medicare appeals. By 2013, we had 384,000, and now we've got over 600,000. And how did we get to this big backlog? A lot of people think it's because of the Affordable Care Act. In 2011, when it was enacted, there was a congressionally mandated Medicare Recovery Audit Program, or a RAC program. And this program was implemented to get or recoup funds from healthcare providers if there were billing errors, you know, just mistakes in billing. They shouldn't have gotten paid that Medicare reimbursement, so we're going to come back and and take that money. Well, because of the overzealousness of the RAC auditors, particularly because of the fact that they're paid by contingency fee, the number of RAC audits just skyrocketed. And all of a sudden, we had this big bottleneck of Medicare appeals, a big backlog up at the ALJ level. And it's, it's very disconcerting for you know, any sort of healthcare provider who accepts Medicare or Medicaid, because this backlog really does create financial issues. See, at the first two levels, the government does not start uh, recouping funds. They allow you to go through the appeal process kind of unscathed. But at the third level, at the ALJ level, they do start calling back money. And this can really create hardship, financial hardship on healthcare providers. And Quite frankly, most of these cases are going to get reversed in favor of the provider. There's a very large success rate on the Medicare appeals, and they're they're going to have to pay the money back. But in the meantime, these healthcare providers are in real financial distress. And we know that the United States District Court for the District of Columbia weighed in on this situation in the American Hospital Association versus Burwell. Can you tell us about that ruling and the implications for HHS at the time? Yes. So basically, the district court for the District of Columbia ruled in favor of the American Hospital Association. The American Hospital Association asked the judge to, they they were basically seeking what's called a mandamus order to compel the Health and Human Service Secretary to clear the backlog and comply with the 90-day statutory time frame for ALJ hearings. And you know, I probably should just go back and just make sure that the, the listeners know that. So according to statute, when you're at the ALJ level, there is a statute that states 
that you have to have your ALJ hearing and the decision within 90 days. Currently, that is far from the truth. We're, we're seeing Medicare appeals with three to six to seven years' time. Uh, sometimes it'll be a couple years before the ALJ is even, even uh, appointed. The, the court, the district court, in, it was December of 2016, the district court ruled in favor of the hospital association and ordered that the health and human service secretary reduce the backlog by uh, 30% by December 31st, 2017. So obviously that was a very important deadline because we would have hit that in the next few months. And then also reduce 60% by December 31st, 2018 and a 100% reduction by 2020. So the, the judge took this very seriously and said, no, you cannot just allow these appeals to sit there for years and years while these providers are having to pay you know, this, this recruitment that they may not even have to pay. The, the district judge ruled in favor and HHS appealed. And what has HHS done to date to try to reduce the appeals backlog? Quite frankly, not much at all. Uh, they have come out since this decision. They have come out and expressed their opinion that it is impossible to meet the uh, the order that the district court judge placed on them, and have really not. They really have not uh, amended anything. They had they amended this hyper technical little uh, procedure that. They said it would reduce the backlog by about 25,000 appeals, but it, that's no way, in, no way even close to the 30% that they would have to do by the end of the year. They did come out, however, in January with a final ruling uh, in hopes of decreasing the backlog. But again, it did not do that much. What it did, it was a ruling that can't, basically it just said, okay, now the Medicare appeals decisions are going to have precedential effect. And what that means is that before one ALJ could rule one way and another ALJ could rule another way, and what they're saying is that we're going to have more consistency and we're going to make them have precedential effect in that they become rules and law that you have to follow. And it would also make people or providers not continue to appeal, you know, repeat issues or if the issue's already been decided, they would already know where they stand. The other thing the final ruling in January 2017 did was it expanded the pool of adjudicators to not just ALJs, but it would also include licensed attorneys employed by the Office of Medicare uh, Hearings and Appeals. So that th the thought process behind that was that if you have more judges, they can adjudicate more cases, which is extremely logical. So they did implement a couple of other things, for example, you can appear by telephone, and that just, just streamlines the process. You can also, uh, the ALJs can now vacate their own dismissals instead of having to go up to the Medicare Appeals Council. Little things like that, but the final ruling that came out, it was, it was obviously came out because of the December 2016 decision ordering them to decrease the backlog. But the final ruling did not do that much, and it certainly did not... Uh, make HHS decrease their backlog as much as the judge ordered them to. And as we've seen, this is a fast-moving process, Nicole. Um, on August 11, 2017, the U.S. Appeals Court for the District of Columbia overturned the earlier ruling from the district court and sent the case back for reconsideration. Practically, what happened and what are some possible outcomes from here? Well, this was a huge decision that impacts all healthcare providers across the country who accept Medicare. And I actually think that this decision has not received much publicity, but it's a really big, uh, big decision that impacts everyone. The Court of Appeals found that the district court judge, before ordering the secretary to do something, i.e. reduce the backlog, the district court judge should have made a ruling that the procedure that they were getting ordered to do was actually possible. It was basically 
putting the, the Court of Appeals Court is saying, hey, District Court, for your opinion, you need to put the cart after the horse. And it is interesting that they made this decision because there are not, there's not very much, many precedential cases that require a district court to find the order in which he's saying, i.e. reducing the backlog of Medicare appeals, is possible to do. And quite frankly, you know, the Court of Appeals took HHS's contention that the action was impossible without even having them give evidence to that fact. So what I mean by that is, you know, the HHS, HHS secretary came out and said, hey, this is impossible. We can't do this. We're not going to be able to comply with this order. In fact, it's going to get worse. Uh, there's going to be about a million appeals by the time 2021 comes around. So we're not going to get better. We're not going to comply. We're going to get worse. But instead of having to prove that, you know, this is, this is a prediction. This is not, you know, Health and Human Services did not, like, go out and really show that they couldn't do it. They just said it, you know, and that's, you know, face value. But the Court of Appeals accepted their argument and sent it down to the district court to determine. And there's a dissent in this opinion, you know, so there's a, an attorney, I mean, I'm sorry, a judge that disagrees with the majority opinion, and I think I fall within the dissenting opinion. The dissent points out that you know, the fact that the Court of Appeals is requiring the district court to find out whether something is possible or not before ordering it is a hyper-technical reading of a procedural statute. And we're working in the real world. We have real world issues with this Medicare appeal backlog. It's so long and so big, and it's causing financial stress to many, many healthcare providers. Because as I discussed earlier, the money is recouped at the level of the third level in front of the administrative law judge. So the money is getting taken from the provider without their due process appeal rights. And the dissent points out that this is very serious and that it affects a lot of hospitals. And to that point, Nicole, what should hospitals be doing now regarding their outstanding appeals? Well, they have multiple options. There is a way to expedite your, your third level appeal. And I think you and the hospital and its attorney really should contemplate whether or not you want to escalate. If you escalate the appeal, that basically means you're skipping the administrative law judge level. But you need to be very careful in determining whether or not you want to expedite because you do lose some procedural due process. You don't get in front of an ALJ to show all your evidence. So, you know, you really have to weigh the pros and cons and have a very you know, detailed conversation with your attorney to determine whether expediting your Medicare appeal is what the, the way you want to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing that they need to do is they really need to prepare for these audits. There, there's been a two-year hiatus on these RAC audits, and now they're going to come back. They're coming back, and they already have the new contract signed, they're going to start coming back and, and implementing them again. And you really need to be ready to have to defend these RAC audits, i.e., making sure you've got enough funds to hire your lawyer and to defend these, these audits. Like I said, a lot of these audits are overturned. I mean, I, the, the appeal success rate is over 80% at least. Yes, uh, great Great direction there, Nicole, and, and, and certainly um, something that hospital finance professionals need to keep an eye on in this uh, sort of ongoing saga of the Medicare appeals backlog. So thanks for coming by the program today and providing your perspective on that. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoy the Hospital Finance Podcast, please head up to iTunes to subscribe and leave us a positive review. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler Consulting. 